All right, well, good afternoon and welcome to It's a Secret, not on the 6 o'clock news conference here in Tempe, Arizona. I'm Dr. Chet Snow. I'll be your host for this weekend. And we're starting on Friday afternoon with our pre-conference institute with really a person that I have the honor and privilege to call a personal friend, a teacher, a leader, a seer, someone who for over 15 years, nearly 20 years, has been channeling beings, non-physical beings, who say they are from the Pleiades, they say they are from our future, they say that they are here in this nanosecond of time as we go from the mid-1980s to 2012 by our Western calendar to help us through the great changes and challenges that are coming. I first met Barbara Marciniak back in 1992. It was just at the time that her first and seminal book, Bringers of the Dawn, was coming out. And we had a wonderful meeting, actually at the home of our conference managers, Ruth and Harry Hover, in Santa Fe, New Mexico at that time. And I will never forget, it was as if Barbara and I just clicked, and I knew that I could talk with her for hours and hours and hours. And that's exactly what we did until Ruth and Harry threw me out. Uh, Barbara was their house guest. So, it was really a great meeting, and we've had many since then. Um, it's always a pleasure to have Barbara. She rarely gives a public a speaking like this, and so it is an honor as well. We will be joining with her, as I said, going to Morocco in June of 2008. So uh, I urge people who are interested in that to get in touch with me, and you can do that through conference. And so without further ado, I want to welcome Barbara Marciniak. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad that um, we're starting off the conference with a really nice energy. I, when I tuned in earlier in the week, I said, oh, probably not that many people will show up. And then they informed me that I was going to have a good crowd. So um, welcome, and thank you, Chet and Kalista, and everyone. And I have been doing this for almost 20 years officially with the Pleiadians. Uh, and in my 20th year now, and I learn continuously. I've learned that whatever I think something is, that's not what it is in general. That makes it safer and easier because the nature of the mind is to name and identify. That's what we do. We want to name it, we want to be comfortable, we want to be familiar, we want to label it. And then unfortunately our educational system and everything that we're involved in in today's incarnation you know, wants to compartmentalize and identify. And that's not what I've learned that, that what I'm exploring is about. Before I started channeling, I was actually 39 when I started channeling, soon to turn 40, so I'm 59 now, soon to turn 60. And in the last 20 years, I, everything that I thought I had had sorted out, you know, <laughs> just keeps changing and evolving. The bottom line is everything is connected. Nothing is meaningless. One can, and people do, become obsessed with these sorts of ideas. And they can use astrology or, or uh, pendulums or anything to, to want to make the decision, is this right, is this not right? What we have to do is live. That's basically it. We're spirits who are incarnated in a body, and we happen to be living in a time that the Pleiadians call the nanosecond. And way back early in the early years, they said, you know, we're here, we come from the future, and there's something really big going on in your lifetime, and you just happen to be lucky enough to be mature and have an, an adult body and an open mind to experience all of this. And the way they defined it is they said from 1987 through till 2012, we would experience an acceleration of energy. And everything would keep going faster and faster and faster. And it would be mirrored in the outside world. But it was really a reflection, a symptom more or less, of what was going on inside. That we were being rewired, reorganized, um, that we were accessing memories that have been long dissociated and suppressed through trauma and through training and conditioning. And sure enough, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's sure come down. The model that they use, 
uh, is that from the first 10 years of this nanosecond period, which again goes from 87 through 2012, the first 10 years the energy, they said, would accelerate tenfold, and that every year things would increase and go faster and faster. That would be from 87 through 96, and they refer to that as phase one. Phase two from um, 1997 through 2006, what they called phase two. And during that period, they said the energy would accelerate a hundredfold each year. So as I'm, I'm sharing this with you, I'd like you all to reflect on your own life and see what happened during phase one for you, what opened up in the years 87 and 88. If you can stop for a moment and think back uh, to what your beliefs were and what you thought things were and how you thought the world was made and, and, and what was what and see if you can tap into your own naivete about interpretations, you know, because, and I always say, well, gee, however sophisticated I think I am now, 20 years from now, I'll look back and I'll go, wow, how naive I was. That's the nature of it. And there's nothing wrong with that naivete. It, it just, it's a demonstration of how we do want to box everything and label everything and, and identify with it so that we feel safe, so that we can proceed. So phase one, acceleration of tenfold each year. Phase two, acceleration of a hundredfold each year. And now phase three began in 2007, and it will conclude according to the Pleiadians in 2012. And again, this is their model. It's a metaphor to help us understand what we're going through. Phase three, the energy accelerates a hundred thousandfold. And I used to think in the early years they were making a mistake, and they really meant a thousand. They didn't. <laughs> they corrected me many times. And so again, reflect back in the last 10 months, 11 months, because we're almost at the end of, of uh, November of 2007. Look at what's happened in your own life, psychically, emotionally, mentally, economically, academically, any area, just in the last 11 months in the world. And you can see that we're really in something big. And um, that's important. This is what I wanted you to know before we start, because in a few minutes I'm going to um, give the afternoon over to um, a session with the Pleiadians. We'll do two, uh, and we'll take a little recess, five minutes in between, and you'll get a chance to ask them questions and really express, you know, what's going on. I will ask you to state your name, first name, when you ask a question, and to make your questions relevant to the whole group. Uh, and if you have a real personal issue that you want, you know, help with, ask the question in such a way so that it doesn't sound like we're doing makeovers for, for each individual, so that we can look at the collective learning, because this is, how, this is how it works. This is how we all learn. We learn from each other. Because my eyes are closed when I'm in trance, you know, you can wave all you want, but, uh, you know, your hands won't, won't, won't determine uh, who gets called on. So you just call out Pleiadians or you say your name, and then they will call on you. And then that's how we will proceed with the afternoon. And we're going to have a mic here. You don't have to go up to it, but please speak loud and clear, and then I'll make sure the Pleiadians reiterate your question so everyone can hear it. Uh, the other thing, another sort of model that I'd like you to hold in your mind in addition to the nanosecond, because when they refer to the nanosecond, you'll know they're referring to these times of acceleration, sort of their shorthand. And they have another little shorthand they use. It's called the garden of the mind. And I didn't realize that I would have AV opportunity this afternoon because I could have had it on the screen and it would have really been helpful, but I, I, I didn't realize that. And the garden of the mind is basically, uh, they've renamed the, the psychological and the scientific models of the mind, um, and they've renamed it the garden of the mind, and the Pleiadians use vegetables to describe what state of mind that we are in. So when they say it's your P, they're referring to your conscious mind or very quick brain waves, brain waves that would operate from 13 cycles per second on up to 30, 33, something like that. And then the next one down is um, the carrot. It's called alpha in the scientific model, and it, it vibrates from 8 to 12 cycles per second, and it's probably one of the most important brain wave um, frequencies that we can get into, and of course our educational system and psychological system pretends it doesn't exist, and that is called carrot or alpha, uh, and it's the area of imagination. 
It's the area of creativity. And when we open alpha and we slow our brain waves down, we get into what the Pleiadians refer to as the back garden. The back garden has the subconscious mind, which is the onion, layers, and in the subconscious mind are all of our memories, every single thing we've ever encountered. When we have regressions with chat or work with Paula on the sand tray, that's the kind of stuff, the memories come up. And then behind the memories would be the potato or the unconscious mind. And each of these areas, in order to get to them, we slow our brainwave frequencies down. So the whole idea to go slower as things go faster is absolutely the name of the game, okay? So during this weekend, you're going to get a lot of information. It's going to sound contradictory. Okay? Different people are going to be saying different things, going to push your buttons. But it looks like it pushes your buttons. It's going to hit you in your chakra areas. It's going to stimulate different uh, back garden issues, subconscious mind, onion, memories from past lives, other lifetimes, Atlantis, way back. And then unconscious mind, what we're not aware of that we're fed how we're programmed, how we program ourselves, how society programs us, and how we can use the subconscious mind or the potato or those really low frequencies to turn it into our psychic radar so that we embrace finally as a race of people, not individuals, but as a just race called people, okay? That we embrace our psychic abilities and we stop thinking that somebody has it and someone doesn't. We all have it. We've just not been trained to use it, that's all. That's what it comes down to, all right? And the other thing, my, my personal experience is in order to experience the nanosecond and get the best miles out of it, you have to be in your body in order to do it. So this weekend, see if you can keep getting in, being present, staying in the now, saying just, I'm not going to miss this. I'm not going to dissociate and go off. And I'm going to stay right here throughout the whole weekend and really see what my higher self and all the other aspects are putting together here, what spirit wants me to know, okay? So I'm gonna move over here now and, uh, and get myself set up. I go into trance very easily. Uh, how many of you are new that have never seen me uh, channel before, worked with me in person? Well, thank you so much, appreciate it. It's always wonderful to have, you know, new people. Uh, it's, there's a lot of energy that will come through me. Uh, if you feel restless or if you feel something that, you know, is uncomfortable, see if you can breathe and sit with it. And if you really feel restless and it's too much energy, then quietly walk out, go in the lobby or go in the back of the room and then come back and sit down. And uh, the piece can be very funny. They can be very direct. Um, they're my buddies. They're everybody's buddies. I'll let them tell their stories and talk to you about what's most important. And then again, you will be asking them questions. You can ask them um, whatever it is. So let me just hook myself up here to my little recording. Okay, I think I can do this. I think I can work with this. Uh, is, or is, do I have a better sound like this? What works? This? This is better. Okay, if I hold it far enough away. Okay, thank you, Ted. Whoops. <clears throat> Maybe we'll get to P the P's to play the harmonica. They do do that now and again. I've taken that up in the last year, kind of in honor of my dad. Okay. Good afternoon. We are here and once again it is our great pleasure to be in your reality. And that reality right now is uh, located at a conference called Shh, It's Not on the Six O'Clock News. You might want to look at that title more closely and see what is hidden in the title. Um, and we are in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, you're all quite excited. That's what brought you here. Something inside of you said, 
there's an opportunity to learn and to grow. And so we are here for the same opportunity to learn and grow and share with you. Our vehicle gave you a bit of background about who we are and what we do. We will speak for a few moments more to, let's say, expand the picture so that you all can relax You're on the edge of your seats. We've never seen this before. What is this, some of you? Relax. There is much to learn. Now, we are a collective of energies. We call ourselves Pleiadians. From your point of view and the way you look at reality, we come from the future. A future that is actually simultaneously occurring along with your now. All time, in actuality, exists in an ever-expanding moment of experience. And all time is collected and, and interwoven with all other aspects of time. Think about that for a few moments. Those of you who are gathered here today, you are, uh, let's say, running in a different meter and different uh, cadence than the rest of society. Does not make anyone right or anyone wrong. It's simply an indication that there are many ways to interpret reality. Today, the world is a product of a marketed, conditioned version of reality, and you want to stuff everyone into one size fits all. And that is not the case. You are living in tumultuous times. But these times are indicative of the spiritual development of society. And because of the acceleration of energy and the model that our vehicle shared with you before we began, um, this acceleration brings up all sorts of opportunities that were not available in what you call the past, not consistently, not across the board. So these are special times. We have often said that uh, the planet is so crowded and everyone wants to come in and uh, birth rates are increasing in many parts of the world because everyone wants to be here. Spirits take on bodies for various reasons. And you may think that uh, because you studied history and you studied Christopher Columbus and uh, the Templars and uh, different uh, people in society uh, did things so long ago that you have convinced yourself that all of this has happened so long ago. But in actuality, if you were able to use your body, which we also refer to as a code reading device, if you were able to use your body to its fullest capacity, you could tune in like remote viewers do, like those who journey out of the body or those who are able to walk the lines of time. You can peek into other realities. In some regard, this is what we do as Pleiadians. We have, in all truth, encountered great difficulty in our version of reality. Being Pleiadians, it means we come from the star system, the Pleiades. And on a nice dark night at this time of year in the northern hemisphere, you can see the cluster of stars. Six, sometimes seven. If you squint a bit, you may see eight. But there are thousands of stars in our nebula. And also within our nebula, there is a black hole. That will be more apparent as time marches on as to the importance of portals, stargates, uh, black holes, and things of this nature. They are not the, let's say, flights of fancy or the objects of someone's vivid imagination in nonfiction or fairy tales. They are part of your history a history that has been distorted and turned around and in the 20th and 21st century, completely rewritten. Not to worry though, friends. Not to worry at all. The truth shall prevail. One of the interesting things about the nanosecond is that as things go faster and faster and faster, what you think comes back to you 
with greater rapidity. This is designed to teach everyone against spirits occupying a body. It is designed to remind the spirits of how things operate in existence, not just on Earth. You are creators. You create every moment of your life. You've created your body in the shape and the size that it is right now. Nothing happens to you from randomness. Everything is cooperative, interconnected, and extraordinarily significantly purposeful. Reflect for a moment on what we've just said, if you would. And accept, if you can, if you will, and truly it is your duty to accept it, that you are a creator, and that you have the free will to create as you would. And if you create with, let's say, malice in your heart or worse, then that will come back to you. And if you create with integrity and honesty and truth, and cooperation, then this is a reflection of what your life will be as it unfolds. No one needs to save you, but you do indeed need to save yourself from yourself. By that we mean that you often hypnotize yourself into self-limiting ideas. The nanosecond, the acceleration of energy, is here to reassure you, and you are here to reassure billions on the planet. You may be thinking, well, when am I going to get to tell those billions or talk to those billions? You do it every moment of your existence. There is no technology, sorry AV fellows, that is more powerful than your own biology. So when are you going to really accept that power and play with it? Well, we'll let you know during the course of the afternoon some of the, the plans and agreements that are structured, that are set into motion, and that can be read from the patterns of the stars and the behavior of people, and also what is happening in simultaneous time. Now, again, we come from the future. Why? Because in our future, a tyranny has reached us, a very nasty tyranny. And we are, as Pleiadians, deeply connected to your planet, long-term ancestors. We are kin travel around the world or open books and look into many of the indigenous cultures and you will find that their core beliefs name the Pleiadians, the Pleiades, as their ancestral lineage. The truth is you do come from the stars and that Earth is a genetic library. We are here because we traced in time, the genesis of the tyranny. It seems that it all takes place and births itself in this quaint little corner of the multiverse called Earth during a time of tremendous acceleration. That acceleration is designed to create a healing along the lines of time, not just to teach you that you are creators, but to inspire you to do something with the energy that you create with and the largest duty you have is to heal yourselves, to empower yourselves in the now, and to begin to glimmer, get a glimmer of understanding that the power of your biological being in, this, in these accelerated times truly ripple out into all avenues of existence. So we have come to help you build a new probable future a future that in the ideal will touch us in the large loop and conveyor belt of energy. Even though this may sound uh, pretty radical from one point of view, this is the way the multiverse operates. And soon you will be incorporating many, many reality shocks and shakeups as a culture as you begin to realize, the planet begins to realize, that you share this space with many beings and that you cohabitat the earth with all sorts of creatures, all sorts of life forms, 
and that those who control your world have done their very best to keep this a big secret. Being that this conference is about letting the cat out of the bag, then we are going to talk about uh, big secrets throughout the weekend. Now, you are here, all of you, because you are ready to go to a new level of change. When you gather together with others who are willing to think and reconsider reality from another point of view, even if you, none of you agree, the idea that you are willing to reconsider reality and to look at the unusual, which has been labeled, labeled paranormal uh, phenomena, this in itself sets out a frequency. That frequency ripples everywhere in a non-local existence, meaning that what you do now can be felt in China, can be felt in the poles, can be felt in, in every aspect and area of the world. This is the power of the mind. The power of mind is going to come into its own. You have a big revolution ahead, major, major revolution on this planet. It will begin round 2012, oh sorry, 2010, round 2010. And the glimmerings that you see in 08 and 09 will be nothing compared to the impact of energy and the change of beliefs and the change of approaching ways of life. Perhaps you now have a glimmer of understanding about why all the spirits want to come onto earth. It makes no difference really from a larger point of view, whether you are born on Fifth Avenue or whether you are born out in the bush under the stars. To be here, to be on earth during these times will go down on your spiritual resume forever, ever, ever. This is a hot spot. And to enlarge in the picture a bit, all forms of consciousness, all types of beings, all shapes and designs of creatures that have ever interacted with Earth are drawn back here now. And this will give you another idea of uh, uh, some of the anomalous activities that are occurring from reptiles and giants to uh, inner earth inhabitants to who are the visitors and what is their agenda. Everyone has come here for one reason or another. But from our perspective, everyone, every being is here to heal. And what are you healing? It's quite simple. You are getting rid of unnecessary fears. What is society doing today but drumming up more and more and more fear everywhere? And what are you learning to do? You are like ducks, letting it roll off your back like water. You must learn to be able to discern the difference between what is an appropriate consideration or concern and what is mind control attempting to control your frequencies and block down your innate joy, your innate creativity. So it is a time for great excitement, it is a time of innovation. Uh, 2008 is going to be a very stunning year as 2007 has been. And in 2007 you had the grace of some very beautiful energy come your way opening you to difficulties on the emotional level, but showing you the grace of the galaxy. And this energy has to do with what we call the galactic mother. And this galactic mother brings truth and creativity to the planet. So if you can embrace the truth, whatever yours is, and whatever versions of reality you meet that show you truth, you will be exuberant in creativity. And this is what your planet needs to, uh, let's say, change the direction that some are steering you in. There is no stopping the revolution. 
revolution of mind, the revolution of spirit. With time being, time being simultaneous, one could say it's a done deal. Because intention is what set things, sets things into motion. And with clear intent and a trusting, trustful heart, there's no stopping anyone. So let's turn it over to you and uh, see what you have to share in response to what we have just uh, given you to think about and consider. Um, please state your names loud and clear when you speak to us and uh, we're quite intrigued with finding out what your concerns are, where you may have difficulty, what area you would like a little more clarity on and understanding. And if we know, we will certainly offer insight. And if we do not have um, perspective to share, we will let you know and pass on it. So. Um, Let's begin now. Sure. Who would like to ask sure. the first sure. question this afternoon? Dennis? Dennis, all right. Loud and clear, Dennis. What is your question? I have a question on... on uh, Ooh, what is all that crackling? On one of your favorite topics um, over the years. That I have a friend who is totally addicted to TV. and Totally I see, addicted to TV? Yeah. And I... Notice ever since I, I have lunch with him maybe once or twice a year, and I noticed ever since he got high definition TV, and he doesn't understand why I don't like TV at all and don't care about it, but you know, and he's trying to impress me with his high definition TV, and I noticed since he got it, he seems to be physically going downhill uh, rapidly, and Which I'm just a good observation that you have made. So um, my question is, and there's a huge push on high definition TV, so what more are they able to do to people through the high definition TVs? All right, good question, Dennis, and interesting that it's the first question. It's always quite significant to see what topics are uh, ready to be addressed. Well, see if you can stop squirming, you TV watchers out there. Uh, don't judge yourselves. It's not about judgment. It is about mindfulness to observe your own behavior and your attachment to it and your beliefs that are behind the behavior. There is a, a steadfast investment in subversive technologies. And you will have speakers this weekend who will go into uh, ooh, minute details and have specialized in understanding these sorts of things. Uh, generally, uh, we will say this. Those there has been a long-term battle for who can control the world. This has been going on for eons, eons and eons and eons. Why do beings want to control the world? Because of the value, value of the library and the genetics that are stored here and what is stored inside the genetics. Those who control the planet, some of them, in minimum numbers, are fully aware that you are in a time of acceleration, of spiritual uh, uh, advancement, and uh, they, have using they are using technology to divert you from your own discoveries. And not only to divert you, but to make money in the process. So monies can be made on high-definition TV. Someone pointed out to our vehicle recently that it was the number one biggest hot must-have uh, uh, item last Christmas. That, that was what everybody and many people got uh, in debt to buy them. This is uh, part of um, marketing, conditioning, programming. Uh, it's what, one of the reasons your world is in a mess today, that people have become so uh, addicted to uh, what someone tells them they have to have, the media. The media is uh, designed today to divert you from spiritual awareness. That is a simple way of saying it. Other aspects of media are designed to disrupt the body, particularly weaken your immune system, so that as you get ill, uh, you then uh, contribute your hard-earned monies, or easily earned monies, to the uh, so-called death care system that passes for health on your planet. 
And uh, of course, if people died from technology instantly, there wouldn't be the opportunity to, let's say, garnish more money. Do you understand? So, and another perspective is this. There are beings who feed off of energy. One would say they are non-physical from one point of view. And uh, some of your world leaders have deep liaisons with these sorts of beings. And so they feed them energy. At the high risk end, uh, um, they would perform what you call ritual sacrifice of humans or animals or things of this nature. And perhaps uh, some of the historical timelines are uh, ruminating around where you can remember that certain societies did kill people in sacrifice to the gods. Today, uh, it's not openly accepted to do human sacrifice, so it is disguised now in what you call war. These vibrations, whether you're watching them on a high-definition TV or whether you are seeing them in movies or whether you are experiencing it firsthand, they are horrific. They are full of pain and fear. And that when the human body turns its emotional dial to pain and fear and anxiety, there is a frequency that goes out. And there are beings who uh, rush in to feed off of those frequencies. High definition TV, like your cell phones, like your iPods, uh, anything you plug in your ears or put to your ear all the time, uh, you have high risk of receiving frequencies that will control your behavior. Another important uh, point of view here is that when you watch TV be and, and work on the computer, because there is no image technically on the screen and you are viewing a stream of electrons, so to speak, the mind shuts down. And it moves from beta, which our vehicle said you would, what we call the P or higher frequencies, it drops down into what is called delta, or sleep state, or the potato, four cycles or seconds per less. And also, when you are in watching TV, no matter what you are watching, your brainwave frequencies move to delta. So it is a highly programmable state. High definition TV not only uh, throws you into that frequency as all TVs have done, but now they are inserting very subversive programs. For what? To modify people's behavior. Remember, remember, if you can remember, in the 1950s, 55, 56, 57, something along there, uh, a man, a behavioral psychologist named uh, Jose Delgado, was able then to prove uh, that he implanted uh, electrodes in or chip in a bull and then had a little box and uh, pushed a button and the bull ran towards him and he pushed a button and the bull stopped. This was a major turning point to determine what would happen in the years ahead. You are now in that era. Our recommendation is put the TVs on the curb and say, free mind control machine. You're not, you're not thinking that's very funny, do you? But one day from the future, you will. One day from the future, it will be seen what the electronics and technology are doing to the human body. All right, Dennis? The, um, as opposed to the old-fashioned watch that goes around, uh, the digital watch I've heard is a lot worse that people wear all the time. Yes, it, especially also if you have a clock next to your bed that is a digital clock. Uh, these things create a frequency that disrupt uh, your natural brainwave cycles. If you want to uh, entrain with who you are and strengthen who you are, the very best way is to get out in nature with no sounds to accompany you, just the creatures. You don't need music. You don't need all these things. 
certainly they are an important uh, part of life, which, as Dennis was saying, his friend became addicted. When you become addicted to something, you lose your mind. And when you lose your mind, something else can come in and possess you. Our vehicle said to you earlier, she said, stay in your body this weekend. Actually, it's best if you stay in your body throughout life. Because if you vacate the body because of some trauma or dissociation or some lack of liking what is going on, and everyone does it, everyone does it all the time, you just don't notice it, you haven't been trained to learn how to observe yourself. But if you vacate the body often enough because you don't like it, then inevitably something comes in to take over. And this subject is a hot ball of wax, hot potatoes, the idea of entity possession. Yet it is as old as the planet in understanding. Who has another question, please? Sure. Eric, all right, what is your question? Welcome. Oh, hi. Um, I have the game board set up in my room, and I put pieces on Who is it. this? Gary. Oh, Gary, we thought you said Eric. Gary, all right, we recognize your vibration. You are working with the game board. Yeah, and I... And if we may add something here. Uh, our vehicle has a game board up here, and... It, we have su suggested that this game board is a map for everyone for navigating the multiverse. If you would proceed now, Gary. So I got the idea to put pieces on the game board, a certain amount of pieces. Such as? Crystals, people's names, gold, um, so you're playing water from the, Gan from the Ganges, a ring from Tibet, uh, owl's claws different things that I got a hit to put them on, different squares, and I muscle tested or doused to see which square these things would actually be on, which column, how they connected. But I, I was wondering if you could give me some clues, like what does that do when I put the pieces on? And then I have ah, another question. There is the doing and then there is the understanding of the doing, yes. Right. And many of you have been doing for quite a few years with crystals and dowsing and, and all sorts of things. And you can keep quite busy doing. But if you don't link the doing to the knowing and the understanding, then what can you do? At, at best, you have a good time. At worst, you get yourself in big troubles. Now, the game board. Quite common, more common than you realize, more powerful than any of you realize. Ubiquitous around the planet, found everywhere. In some of the oldest ancient cultures, the Dogon, for example, they use the black and red and white uh, checkered game board, and they claim it's one of their oldest, most revered, cherished artifacts. A game, a map for navigating the multiverse. So what is Gary doing when he takes this black and white board and instead of playing checkers or chess, he starts to put on objects of significance, things that mean something to him or that have uh, come from places around the planet. From, from his experience now, because you all have, if you've played with the game board, it, it will apply to all of you, but will, we'll use Gary as an example. What he would be doing in his now, in his 21st century now, is he would say, oh, I like this owl claw. Oh, water from the Ganges. I remember how powerful it was to go there. Gold, wow, gold has got some inherent value. We, uh, gold is the love frequency. It is the veins of the earth. It carries and conducts all sorts of information. What he would be doing is in his current gariness, he would be selecting things that were important to him in this now, but that really would be bridge artifacts across time. So what you are doing is moving things around and on some level, your neurology is collect connecting with other incarnations, if you choose to use that word, of yourself, other realities where you are just as viable and just as alive. You may say, well, I've had a regression, and I saw I was in India uh, in, in 777, uh, and uh, uh, how could I be alive now? That's already gone. None of these realities are gone. This is what the big quanandrum and the revolution of science is all about. 
as the scientists uh, break ranks and start to uh, explore what's going on, they realize everything is multidimensional, concurrent, simultaneously unfolding. And so one act is simply the other side of another act. So you are getting in touch with other aspects of self, Gary, uh, that in time, in the next few years, by 010, around then the big revolution kicks hold on the planet, um, the revolution again is of mind. And your mind will become quite crystal clear as to what all of these effects are about. We would say uh, to have reverence, and um, say if you want to find out something more, if you have the water from the Ganges on one square or whatever you have, um, put your hand on it at some time and make clear intention and say what's going on in that reality that is so significant that I, 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 I honor it or I place it with special playing power in my now. You see, first you're going to play with the symbols, the, 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 the sigils of these times. And then as the energy changes your nervous systems, and it is changing everyone quite, quite rapidly, as that energy rewires you from inside on a subatomic level, there will be a time when, like a button is pushed, a comet streaks across the sky. It will act as a signal on a very, very deep level, and people will raise to another level. Being that you've just had a comet streak through the sky and uh, seem to implode to be larger than the sun now, we would say these are quite auspicious times. And that the, can be interpreted as a signal to fire codes of consciousness across the planet without your P or conscious mind having any bother at all about it. All right, Gary? Yeah, thank you. Yes, Who is it? Yes, yes Bud? Wesley. Wesley. All right. Wesley, what's your question? You're speaking in English. I understand Polish language. How come are people... Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. We, we talk about time, all the time, about time, time, time. What does that mean, the time? I would like to find out what time is so znaczy czas. You would like to find out what it mean time. This Just the, the, the word time. Right. This is a very, very good question. If as a spirit in a biological being, you were aware of all of the times that you have lived and everything that was going on and every bit of land vibrated, all the different things that happened on it, how could you have an experience? Who would you be? Time is a local custom. It allows you to encapsulate an experience, to build something unique and to experience life. Spirits come into the body primarily, primarily for love. That's what really the reason is. As a spiritual being, and you're all spiritual beings, and everyone on the planet is a spirit, but when you take the body on, there's something that happens here that is beyond richness. The frequency of love is sought after throughout the multiverse. And Earth has its own unique richness, flavor of love. So each segment of time allows a separation, a compartmentalization of experience. Within that compartmentalization of time, different eras or civilizations are built, and the raw materials of creativity can be expressed uniquely whether in Poland or South Africa or the depths of the Congo or Gambon or Morocco or here in Tempe. And you take it all for granted, and yet it is rich beyond compare because each reality had to be built by mind, by activity, by belief. 
And you see, when you are not in the body and you are spirit, and you can, uh, if you gain this capacity, and you must earn these capacities, just because you are not in the body does not mean you are going to be a brilliant spirit. Everything must be earned, dear friends. And you earn it by showing whether you uh, rever it or not, whether you cherish it. And people who cherish monies, well, they, they will accumulate monies, but you know the expression, you can't take it with you. But you do take your consciousness with you. That is what you take with you. So, when you are not in a body, and you can look at the various versions of self that are segmented in different aspects of time, those experiences, individually and collectively, through family, through culture, through marriage, they all contribute to some great expression of creativity. That's what you are doing. You are always expressing your creativity. You may say, well, I'm not expressing creativity. I'm struggling to pay the bills. That is an expression of creativity because if you are struggling to pay the bills, then you have a belief inside that says, I must struggle. And yet you have the free will as a spirit to come into a body and take on any beliefs you want. And then experience the, the, the conveyor belt of energy. You think of something and then it comes back to you. You set an idea for yourself, oh, I'm always slower, or I'm brilliant, or I'm lucky as can be. You hypnotize yourselves all the time with these ideas. So collectively, all these iso isolations of time are going to come together in the nanosecond, and time will appear to fall away from about 2010 onward. In a few months, Pluto, one month, two months, Pluto will be about two moons from now, we'll be moving into the sign of Capricorn. Capricorn um, rules the body, as, let's say the spine and the skeletal form, and also time. Pluto disrupts things. Pluto brings out the truth from the underworld. So one could say from January until, oh, 2024, something like this, uh, as Pluto is in Capricorn, you will see a whole restructuring of time, an understanding of time. And the trick is, is that you must never lose the home station, the current now. The value, the identity that you have, the country that you come from, the parents that you have, the, the you that you are. But it's only one version of you. It's a costume. Truly, it's a costume that you are wearing. And just as you can change costumes and wardrobes, you can, in this lifetime, change your beliefs about what you think you are. That's why we are here this weekend. Because this is a very, very powerful point in time. Pluto has just gone over the galactic center two weeks ago. Two weeks, three weeks ago, Pluto made a final pass to the galactic center. If you understand the, the logistics of space, you know that the Milky Way galaxy is gigantic and that the galactic center ooh, is perhaps from your counting over 30,000 light years from where you are right now. And if uh, and that is very, very, very far away. Pluto is very close to you compared to uh, where the galactic center is. And you know darn well that you cannot even see Pluto in the sky. It's very, very far away. But Pluto lined up with the galactic center, and it does this every 250 years. So wherever you were, October 26, 27th, and 28th, and whatever you were doing, uh, you imprinted this next phase of development, of revolutionary change of truth and creativity with whatever you were doing. So now, just a few weeks later, uh, we are here because we want to remind you of the ripeness and the opportunity of energy and to do something with it, to be profound and to have courage. And that courage must always include speaking the truth. And as you speak the truth in this time, 
it will affect all the other times that you are connected to. Question. Oh, we have a lot of popcorn popping here. Good. Let's hear from a lady. Okay, Who thank is it? you. What is, what is your name? Mary. Mary. Oh, it loud and clear. Mary. All right. Um, in our physical bodies, we are able to dream. Of what importance is that? And can spirits dream, or do they not need to? Oh, good questions today. We are quite impressed with, your, uh, with the, the subjects that you are deeming important. You do dream. And in the model our vehicle shared with you that we have used to help you understand yourselves, the garden of the mind, it is in the potato or the unconscious mind uh, where you dream. And these are when you are in four cycles per second or less, when the brain wave activity slows down, you go into dreaming. Dreaming actually builds realities. Dreaming is like being in spirit. In physical reality, if you want to check something out, uh, it might be a lot of work to, to say, well, do I want this house or this house or this house or this house? Well, I'll build them all and move in all of them and see which one I want. Relatively difficult to do, yes? You can do it with clothes. You can go shopping and say, all right, I'm going to buy a new wardrobe and I'll, I'll put all these things on, I'll try them on, so to speak, and select the one that I want. Dreaming is somewhat similar. You literally put on an experiment with different versions of reality. You transcend time in the dream state. And of course, your behavioral scientists are very well aware of this, and this is why um, they have occupied your time for the last 50, 60 years with TV. Taking over the time of creativity, which of course when you watch TV again, you are in the similar brainwave frequencies that you are when you are dreaming and sleeping. Now, dreaming helps you to choose reality. Uh, you test things out in, in dream state that you may not end up manifesting in reality. One could say dreaming is where you go shopping for reality. Dreaming is where you meet your neighbors. Uh, dreaming is where some of you confront uh, popes, priests, and presidents, and uh, people of power, and you have no problem walking up to them and say, hey, what do you think you're doing? You're messing up the planet. It is a place where many of you lead, where in waking life you would be quaking to lead. Do you understand? You are more outspoken. Dreams are very fascinating, and another important thing to understand about dreams is that they are not necessarily something that is sequential. You may interpret them as sequential, particularly if you write them down. However, when you dream and you uh, then awaken from those dreams, you think, oh, I had a dream and it was this, this, and this, and this, and here's the story. And indeed, that dream will be laden with symbols, laden with clues uh, that have to do with uh, your psychic bloodline, meaning the issues that you are uh, working on throughout your reincarnational journeys. But also, they will be fragments of perhaps 10 dreams. You dream on levels. And again, we use your terminology to help describe something that is beyond the terminology. But think of this way, an elevator. And you walk into a building and that elevator goes to 26 floors. And you decide for the heck of it because you have nothing else to do that you are going to go to every floor and get off. Do you understand? Walk around and get back on and go to the next floor. Dreaming is somewhat similar. If you have an issue that you want to resolve, um, you all go to sleep with issues. You understand? What am I going to do about this tomorrow? Fix the car, the kids, the money, the whatever. You all go to sleep with issues and you work those issues out. And if you would go to sleep with the idea to say, it is my intention that I am going to dream solutions to these events, then you would get far more miles out of your sleep and dreaming. And for those of you who have to take tests, it's an old trick that you say, ah, tonight I will take the test in my dreams, and in the morning I will ace it. You understand? You can set up these types of agreements with reality. They don't have to happen to you. So if you have an issue, for example, something very simple, or you're in between jobs and you want to find a job, 
and you are looking for employment, or maybe you are looking for a new place to live. You may have dreams, and you may dream on 26 levels, just like that uh, building with the 26 floors. And you may get off on each one of those levels and dream something about your particular issues on all those different levels. And then when you wake up, it's almost as if there is a, a compression of those issues. And then you wake up and you have what you remember to be a dream. And that dream is filled with keys that are showing you that you are working for solutions. Does it help you understand, Mary? Very good. Who else has a question? Ooh, all right. Let's hear from another lady now. We've had a few men. Who is it? Paula. All right, Paula. Um, just to piggyback what you were talking about creativity in the previous question. Yes, because this is Paula, the sand queen herself. <laughs> sand Let's call her the sand goddess. How is the that? The sand goddess, yes. yes. Um, I have a concern. I mean, there's so much going on. There's a lot of intensity, a lot of seriousness. And I'm hoping the Palladians can come up, a comment on the power of creativity and play and that some of the greatest discoveries and some of the greatest solutions are creative solutions that come through means that we often don't tap into. And if you can comment on that, because I think balance is going to be extremely crucial, especially during this next phase of life. All right. Excellent question, Paula. Our vehicle has done therapies with Paula, and we and our vehicle do highly to be recommended. Not only is she an excellent facilitator, but what she is doing in her work play is to ask people to play, to play into knowledge. And when you play, when you are children, or a few weeks ago we had a big party in North Carolina and called it the Galactic Celebration Weekend, uh, sort of a prelude to 2012. Uh, and basically the weekend was organized uh, around a good time. Certainly learning was a part of it and following some agreements and, and working together. But basically it was about hilarity. It was about creativity. It was about music and laughter, all done spontaneously. And uh, after the people left, they said they had never laughed so hard in their lives. One woman said it was the best party she's been to in 250 years. <laughs> Our vehicle liked that comment. It was quite good. Uh, however, it is this ability to tap into the back garden that is so important. Remember, the P or the conscious mind is the part of the self that is rewarded. It is the part of the self that wants to be obeyed, that wants to be recognized, that wants to achieve, that wants to say, I did, look at me, I wrote this many books, I traveled this many places, I know this much information, etc., etc., etc. All fine and dandy. But what's it connected to? And what's the purpose? The purpose comes through play. And we'll tell you a very easy way to allow those play frequencies to open for you. It's quite simple. You separate your jaw and you relax your tongue. The old yoga techniques, yes? When you separate your jaw and you relax your tongue, you immediately shift your brain waves from higher beta frequency or conscious down into the bridge, we call it, or the carriage bridge, or alpha. And once you get into a slower vibrational frequency, you then tap into your own inner knowledge. This is what all meditation and yogas and all sorts of things are all about. It's learning what buttons to push on the body to get it to work. You know how to push the car buttons, the computer buttons, but the body still boggles you. So if you can learn that it is rejuvenating and it is enhancing to play. Mindlessly, sillyly, you will gain your health and your freedom. Because when you laugh and when you play, you reinforce your immune system. When you sit in front of videos, TVs, DVDs, whatever these things are called, all the letters, numbers, digital TV, is that what it is? High definition, whatever. Um, you shut off your, your flow of creativity. And you are allowing other forms of creativity to come at you. Your duty is to create yourselves. 
to make special time to create, to become the living artiste and yet not lose the home station, to be productive as well. So play is essential. And in the next number of years, there's going to be a huge turnaround in what you consider important. It is quite obvious you are in economic dire straits and uh, um, it is, we would not put too much credibility or trust in, in your politicians or your Federal Reserve chairmen or any of these people. They are not going to say to you, whoa, folks, looks like bad news coming down the pike. They are going to say, late breaking news, here we go, the economy is going to, ooh, one-tenth of one percent is a little higher, yes, it's going to be okay. They're not going to let you know that these things are uh, crashing and crumbling and beyond their control. And for some of the global elite, they want society to crash and crumble. And we will say this to you, what could be in it for you? On some level, when you all dream together as the world, when the world dreams together, the world says, hmm, how are we going to get out of this big material mess we are in? We keep buying and buying and building more and there's no place to put the junk and we have to ship the junk to other countries to get rid of our garbage and we have now nuclear waste we don't know what to do with and we have so much stuff and stuff and we are buying more and more stuff. If we don't buy stuff, then the economy is going to collapse. What's going on? The economy is going to collapse and it's going to disengage you from this massive treadmill of material consumerism. These next few years are going to be shocking for many, many people who have not, have not put their built-in shock absorbers on. You understand? We are giving you forewarning that you are here for spiritual development while enjoying the material world. But you must balance your way through the material world and the very best rule you can make for yourselves is never do something that you cannot afford mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally and economically. If you can't afford it, guess what? Don't get in debt for it. House and an auto, that's about the only thing. Because it is a deficit of energy. And look what has happened in the last eight years or seven years of, of political turmoil. Your debt has been increased by trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So there's going to be a big pullback energetically. And um, everyone's going to find themselves um, modifying. Many areas of the world are, especially let's talk about the United States, because this is where most of you come from, uh, you are going to have severe water shortages. Water is one of your most prized resources. And yet how often do people just watch it go down the drain? How often do people open the tap and offer a simple prayer of thanks, oh, thank you, water? And some of the greatest blessings that you have you take for granted. And part of the experiment has gone so far that you have lost consciousness as a people. So Chet's conference, Chet's and Kalista's conference and all the people that have come here to, to listen and to learn and to speak, you all want to change. What will tell you the truth, the changes that are going to be required are bigger than what you want to make or think that you can make. And yet there is a plan underneath that as the material world wavels and crumbles, there will be an implosion of consciousness, the enterprise and expansion of consciousness will have room then to blossom into your lives. Question? Joanne, Joanne yes? Joanne, Duane. Duane, all right, Duane. Sorry if we did not hear them exactly. You mentioned earlier about dealing with a tyranny in your time or place or how you refer to it. Yes. Is there something that we can be doing to help with that because I believe your future is our future, am I correct? Yes, uh, even though it looks as if we are in the future, it is all simultaneous and our, let's say, 
your past is our past as well. So we are all deeply connected. What can you do about it? Well, let's say you are doing right now. Think of all the people around the planet who are watching high definition TV right now and don't want to know. All right? Billion, maybe? maybe? Not quite, but quite a few up there, even if they have the old models. And yet, we said earlier that the power of your biology is far more powerful than any technology. And that will be demonstrated very soon when solar activity and cosmic activity start knocking out satellites as if they are dominoes tumbling. And that will be a reality check for everyone. So when you invest your attention on something significant, then that is shifting the tide. When you know that you are only here for the world of peace, that you are not available for a nuclear reality, when you dream, that's, that's voting. You vote with your mind when you make these decisions. In the dream state, you share these ideas and you meet with those in the world who want these things. It is not as if, let's say, you need to be hoping that the spiritual uh, revolution is going to take place. It is taking place. It's bigger than any of you can ever, ever, ever imagine. Yet it can only be moved by each individual. And each individual and their perceptions and their attitudes and attention is of utmost importance. So you are helping us right now. And the more you start to realize the power that you have inside to remember, to make a difference, to heal, to be one less person that is not saying, fix me, make me, do me, bail me out of this, uh, um, this uh, subprime mortgage thing, or give me free health care, I don't know how to take care of myself. That's all nonsense. You must all learn to take care of yourselves. Once you do that and you get that idea inside, then you lay out a frequency of what is possible. And it might be someone 800 miles away who wakes up from the dream and changes their life because you made a decision and you'll never meet them, maybe. That's how it works. That's how it is all connected. And of course, when you make a decision here, it is going to ripple throughout the lines of time. Let's go off a moment on the lines of time. Wounded. You've all been wounded. You've all been through war. You all have bloodline connections to war. You have reincarnational experiences with war, with horror. In this lifetime, we are pretty certain that uh, most of you in this room are not at all for war or violence. You've made a commitment, not in this lifetime. You've laid down the sword. There are billions of you on the planet who would never pick up arms. Do you understand? And that presence is preventing many things from occurring. And when you choose not to perpetuate violence against another in order to get your way or to have your opinion supersede someone else's, you reach great spiritual maturity. And in so doing, you then pull other aspects of self around the lines of time out of war. So bear that in mind. Questions? Everyone's yelling at once here. It's so hard. Oh. Yeah, this is uh, Shane here. Um, I got a couple oh, of questions. Low, lower, please. Low. What is your oh, name? Oh, uh, my name's Shane. All right, um, a lower. Right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, um, can you tell me the metaphysical, archetypal, or even the personal significance of the number 33? And also, do you know the best remedy for what I like to call survival sickness? You know, the kind of sickness that pervades this kind of listless inundation of constant wait, 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 wait. We are missing, 33 is a master number, of course. Yes. And, and double digits have vibrational frequencies, and basically they are used by 
churches, military secret societies, uh, and the numerical system, of course, is Arabic, as you well are aware. And the Arabs, of course, uh, are not giving a, a, a decent rap today or the credit that they have for remembering things across apocalyptic times. It was the Arabs who were quite highly evolved while the Western world was still rather barbaric in those terms. But there are frequencies of achievement. And uh, uh, let's say that uh, for your own self or for anyone, um, it is up to you to remember it. But double digits are very powerful numbers uh, to use, and they are markers along the lines of time that remind you of something. And they are not owned, let's just say, necessarily by the Masons or any particular organization. Now, your second question was vibrational funk or something like this? Uh, survival sickness. A survival remedy. sickness? Right. The... the Basically, uh, you what know, is this? We have not heard this term before. Well, it, it's. Uh, I guess you can kind of liken it to the constant inundation of, you know, images and and uh, stress that you take on as a result of merely living surviving rather than living. Obviously, you know, in other words, people are so constantly consumed with being consumed that. Right. You know what I'm talking All about. Right. So how did one deal with this? Is this well, your question? Well, what, what, yeah. What's the, uh, the the greatest remedy, at least that you know of, to get out of that? Attitude, attitude, attitude. An attitude is another word for beliefs. And in order to change your beliefs, you make an intention. We know this sounds quite flippant and quite uh, concise, but this is how it works. So if you see that um, people are, are getting into these survival funks and these lower vibrations because of all the stuff that's out there. Think about this. You are all creators of your reality. You create the mass environment. You create the weather. You create your own individual environment, your bloodline, your experiences, your intelligence or lack of. And so therefore, ask yourself, why am I living and helping to uh, participate on a mass level in these times of... of, of survival with comfort. You all go home. You have a bed mostly. You have food with no problem. You have flush toilets. You have warm, warm water. All of which would have been high privilege in, in, in something that you could not even imagine in other lines of time. So you have certain basics. It's where you choose to put your attention. Now, yes, this stuff is out there, and our vehicle, too, gets into despair sometimes, and, uh, and uh, she has learned uh, uh, not to overstimulate herself with all of these ideas and beliefs that are being thrown at you. And so what you to do to, to deal with this is develop a, a sense of sovereignty and make space for yourself. Own your space, first of all, and make a declaration that no one can own your space but you, your space being your body. And that you are grateful for having a body and being in it, and that it is your intention as you move through this ride of life that this is what you are available for. And you can learn to sort of allow uh, others to, to play out what they need to play out, to be of the world but not necessarily caught up in all of that. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the more time you spend in nature, away from busy lifetimes, the easier it is going to be. Because nature, again, conforms to your identity. When you walk through the woods, each of you, the woods or the forest or the desert responds differently to each individual frequency. And the nature reads your vibrations and then feeds back what you need to create, quite simply, hemispheric balance, body balance, uh, and, and to restore calm within your biological being. Uh, if you, if the world looks too crazy, then certainly unplug those TVs and stop and stop going to the movies and stop putting your money into things that perpetuates the craziness. It would do you all well, also in the next few years, to uh, get into volunteer work. If it looks as if things are falling apart and you are driven to separation and craziness, then open your heart, devote some time to working with humans who perhaps do not have the freedom that you have to move around, 
which on some level uh, have equal dignity, and yet you can learn from offering assistance to special needs children, to the young, and certainly the elderly are going to have a massive message for you to learn. And soon you are going to be the elderly. You don't think that's funny, do you? Well, you are going to have more cycles around the sun, and those cycles around the sun are going to give you uh, greater information. So uh, there are many ways to antidote. Get together with people. Uh, we always say new moon, full moon's a great time to have gatherings and have everyone cook something. No store-bought food, no packaged food, nothing processed. Homegrown food, homemade food. And eat together and talk together and laugh and play music. These are the oldest ways. Build families with like-mindedness. Stop waiting for someone else to do something. Because every time you do these things, you raise the vibration. Questions? Who over here? Don, Donna, all right, Donna. Diane. Diane, all right, Diane's here. Um, Donna can come next. You were talking about the revolution of mind and also um, with that spirit. And I was wondering about how, in the next coming years, how would this affect our world religions? And um, will this create more chaos and war? I hope not. But, you know, there are um, millions and millions of people that are tied into their religions and feel this is the only way? Yes, this is a very good question, Diane. Anything else? Did you say, or should we answer? Uh, yes, would you answer that? Because, you know, uh, my family is, they're very um, deeply, um, they're Catholic, and I've tried to talk to them, and I give them my ideas. They think I'm a real space cadet, but that's all right. But, I know with things going on that it's very difficult for them. And I, if it's for them, I know it's for millions of people too. All right, this was said with good empathy and compassion. Uh, Gary, how are we doing on time? Uh, 5.58. All right, good. We have plenty of time to answer this. It's a very, very important question because it touches every single one of your lives. As uh, people who walk the edge a little bit and uh, play once in a while, put your black sheep uh, clothes on here and there, you can all relate to knowing people or having family and friends who do think you are wacky or way out there or whatever. But uh, from one perspective, those people who think you are wacky are just as wacky. Do you understand? And you could say that to them. Well, you think I'm wacky. I think you're just as wacky. And that will give them something really to, to dream on at night. Now, society is designed in such a way, civilizations are designed in such a way, uh, that before you are born, you know sort of the mass agreement that you are going to come into. And so let's say the mass agreement that you all knew you were going to be born into is there would be cars on earth and that this would be part of it. And if it was 200 years earlier, you would be using different modalities of transportation, food, clothing, etc. So before you come on, you are very aware of what the mass agreement will be, how people will... Um, conduct life and what they will believe and, and how they will then exploit those beliefs or live out those beliefs. No matter what you believe, there's always a bigger belief that can be had. So you can look at different groups around the planet and say, wow, they are real fundamental black and white thinkers. Look how limiting their ideas are. If one steps outside of this, then, then kaboom. Uh, look today what's happening in parts of Iran, where, uh, and even Iraq, where not so many years ago, few decades, women could wear dress as Westerners, they could wear mini skirts, they could put uh, their hair showing, and wear a bit of makeup, and now today women are terrified to go out of their house unless they are veiled, unless they have full garb on. 
Oh, they are, they are found dead in the streets. So uh, people become fanatical with their beliefs. And when their beliefs are threatened, then they become even more desperate with their beliefs. Now here's the thing about religious beliefs. What is religion? What is it really? Think about it. Some of you are raised Catholics, um, Jewish, um, and let's say Protestants, and uh, perhaps there are some Hindu, Buddhist, uh, um, maybe even Muslim beliefs. But what are these religions? They are a way of people on earth wanting to understand the other world. Yet talk about the other world and say, you know, I'm interested in the other world. People say you're crazy. But every religion uses the term other world. So it's quite well known that there are other worlds. Religions, one could say, have been set up by beings, physical and non-physical, who wish to, on a very neutral level, uh, study humanity as they would go through various experiments of beliefs. On a more ominous level, one could say that certain beings set up religions as custodial organizations to contain and control people, to have them feed their emotional energy towards something and their physical monies and bodies towards something else, and that would keep them compartmentalized uh, by creating a hierarchy where in order to get to the other world, you had to pay or go through a human uh, uh, um, vehicle. And this is all control. It's all control. But you see, religious beliefs run very, very deep. They are not just about this lifetime. They are in your gene genealogy. So great, 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 great grandma might have been a fanatical Catholic. And so that program or that approach to reality is passed on in the blood. You never meet these people but you keep living what they do over and over again. Now consciousness involves the ability to ask yourself, oneself, is what I am doing productive? Am I working towards productivity? Am I enhancing my life or taking away from it? That's consciousness, a form of it. When people get caught up in religious beliefs, there is no self-reflection of this nature. There is a should. There is a guilt. There is a duty. Christianity in particular is emphasized on sin. Even more important, and we are not going to denigrate all of the world religions, we are going to simply show you how they are symbols of other realities. Uh, Christianity uh, basically uses the game board. You say, Ooh, I didn't know Christianity uses the game board. It's true. If you travel around the world and look at the various churches, you'll see those black and white checkers everywhere. But more important, those black and white checkers could not be built without a core symbol called the cross. Look at this black and white board here, and you will see. We have five minutes now. Thank you. It is a series of crosses that are connected to make a grid, and that grid is filled in with black and white energy denoting positive, negative, day and night, black and white, etc., or one and zero. One being white, zero being dark. One being the phallus, zero being the womb. Now, when a world religion takes a character who is really not even reported to have existed, and makes a composite of him, as the famous Constantine and his gang did. And they put him, not in his most glorious moment of supposedly rising from the dead, but they put him on a cross, crucified. And for thousands of years, people wear this symbol on their thymus gland, between their heart chakra and their throat chakra. You say, why is that so important? We say to you, wherever there is the center of a cross, it is a point of power. Remember, 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 the witches always used to gather at the crossroads. That was a point of power. 
So what has Christianity done? They put a dead man on the point of power and say, hmm, better not think about going here. The grid being a map to other worlds, to heaven, so to speak, to getting into multidimensional living. Quite simply, there has been a massive shake-up. You can see it in Christianity by the last number of years of all of the exposure of the abuse of children. And notice how it's been contained and covered up. You don't get the details, you just get the stories. And some of you have been closer to it. Other, do not think that other religions are more holy. When you deal with power, you deal with the potential of corruption of that power. And that corruption will correspond to the various energy centers in the body. So, because the two most important energy centers that you first must get down to would be root chakra and sexual chakra, chakra one, chakra two, uh, this is where you find most of your, your failings. And uh, let's say that world religions are going to go through a huge turmoil in the next few years as the so-called uh, extraterrestrial UFO, uh, other world inhabitants begin to show their place. This is of utmost importance. Uh, sometimes people would rather lose their money than lose their religion. It is true. Because it is how they identify. And so there's going to be a lot of turmoil about this. However, and we'll take a recess in just a moment, there'll be shattering of beliefs. And there would have been a shattering of beliefs long, long, long ago, but you must remember that those that hold the world religions together, they all belong to secret societies. They are not steadfastly uh, uh, religious. They have all been infiltrated by different Masonic groups and secret societies of unknown variety of sources that have access to very old planetary information. And they know darn well if they brought that information forward and disclosed it to the public, all religions would fold overnight. Now, going to be big, big turmoil in these next few years, and we'll talk about this in part two of this afternoon's discussion. But things do not just happen on a physical level. They happen on a level of energy. And we will say that one of the greatest things you can look forward to is, well, how do we describe it? The Catholics have a picture of it, and they called it Pentecost. Do you remember? And it was supposedly after Christ had risen and spent a bunch of days on the surface then everyone got together and then he went back into heaven and everyone had the dove and the energy come down to their head, etc. You remember the pictures, those of you who saw that thing? Uh, one could say that is a wonderful symbol for a dispensation of energy that can be spread across the board to everyone on the planet so everyone has a big aha, a big letting go, a big new connection to reality. Dream it. Let's take a recess for about ooh, five minutes or less, please. Don't run off too far, and we'll come back for part two of this afternoon's discussion. Great to see you. Thank you. Great pleasure.